Hello. It's good to see you. Today, I'm going to read to you a little bit about the history of Springs Mills. You might have seen some of Springs uh, textiles. They make sheets and towels and all kinds of things. This book gives a little bit of the history of Springs Mills, Springs Industries. We are on chapter two. And we're just going to pick up here with chapter two. This is a 1931 picture of Elliott Springs in Lancaster cotton mills with some of the obsolete machinery he inherited. That's a crazy look. Can you imagine? My uh, grandfathers, both of them during different periods of time worked in textile mills. And my dad was also, he was a fixer in a mill for a number of years. Um, you know, with equipment newer than this, but he, you know, he was like one of the mechanics at the mill, so he would help fix machines and stuff. Okay, chapter two. When his father died someday, he would own the mills and their corporations and have more work to do. He would own them, but whether he would hold them or not depended on how much he could learn before that fatal day. They had tottered before, they would totter again. Their owner must also be their master, lest their tottering bring about his fall. Clipped Wings by Elliot White Springs, 1927. In April 1931, Elliot Springs inherited six cotton mills and 11 subsidiary corporations. One mill, Eureka, had shut down. There were 5,000 employees, 7,500 looms, and 300,000 spindles. The plants and property were valued at $7,250,000. That's a lot in 1931. Colonel Leroy, Leroy Springs had lost his zest for cotton mill management by the mid-1920s. His 1928 shooting added emotional trauma from which he never fully recovered. During the last three years of his life, the colonel was in poor health and found his business a burden. He was more interested in finding a suitable buyer for his property than he was in replacing the obsolete machinery or in recruiting new blood into the companies. Some people who were in a position to know that to know said later that Elliot inherited a mess. Springs owned cotton mills were, o were owed large sums of money by outside commission houses that were in bankruptcy. If Elliot Springs had any doubts about his ability to so successfully manage his inheritance, he didn't reveal them to the public at the time, but he later wrote that his first surprise after his father's death was that the New York selling house that had handled his father's goods was bankrupt with every cent of Springs money tied up with it. J.W. Medford thought this to be Elliot's hardest time. Elliot saw clearly that he needed what he needed to do to save the business. He further wrote about himself, to pay the estate tax, Elliot had to run the mills. To run the mills, he had to have new machinery. And to get the machinery, he had to have new money. Elliot liquidated the cotton and cloth inventories that Leroy had been saving ever since William Jennings Bryan had threatened the country with inflation. And then he gave the industry another surprise. Instead of following the fashion and curtailing, he expanded. In the summer of 1931, the people of Fort Mill, Lancaster, Chester, and Kershaw were not aware of Elliot's fight to keep his father's holdings out of the hands of New York bankers. Elliot was in New York. The people at home had many questions. What would happen now? Would the mills manage to keep their doors open when others were closing? Could Elliot make a go of it? Did he even want to? Elliot Springs had already proven himself a natural leader in the heat of battle. Leroy Springs had made sure that every newspaper in the area printed stories about his son's aviation exploits and the medals he won during World War I. The local people knew that Elliot was bright. The word had spread that he graduated from Princeton with honors and was the youngest member of his class. The mill community was also aware that Elliot Springs had made a lot of money writing about his adventures. They knew that Elliot had additional money from stories his father didn't approve of. 
Elliot was one of the highest paid writers in America and may have been the highest paid short story writer. Perhaps to needle Leroy, Elliot always deposited the checks in his father's bank and boasted that he never sold a story for under $2,000. Not everything said about Elliot Springs was complimentary. Some worried that he was nothing more than a restless and reckless stuntman who couldn't settle down. Others thought him a nonconformist, a loner who trusted only his own instincts. Some thought him a tinkerer who would quickly become bored with the mill routine. Give him a couple of years, they predicted, and he'll take off to Europe to fight the Bolsheviks as he threatened to do back in 22. His father fired him once for buzzing the mill on a work day when he was supposed to be at his desk. Some found his aerial stunting and fast driving amusing. Others shook their heads and wondered whether Elliot could, to use one of Leroy's phrases, plow a straight furrow. Colonel Leroy could be proven wrong, would be proven wrong. Elliot could indeed plow a straight furrow. He would do what his father had not, consolidate and modernize the plants. He would survive in spite of the Great Depression and a major attempt to unionize the mills. Elliot prospered, contrary to his father's gloomy forecast. The communities of Lancaster, Fort Mill, Chester, and Kershaw were to prosper with him. For 28 years, Elliot Springs was to lead the Springs textile organization with skill, intelligence, and courage, and in the end, build a unique textile company. The first major task Elliot undertook was the consolidation of his mills. That took two years. He created the Springs Cotton Mills in 1933 following a complicated series of moves which consolidated into one company the five cotton mills he owned jointly with an assortment of stockholders who had shares in one or more of the separate companies. The first stage of the consolidation began shortly after Leroy Springs' death, April 9, 9, 1931. First, the Lancaster Cotton Mills acquired the Fort Mill properties in Eureka and Chester. The Lancaster Cotton Mill stock control of Fort Mill Manufacturing Company, the name still used in 1931 for the two Fort Mill plants, dated back to 1917. On October 6, 1931, the 106 minority shares of Fort Mill Manufacturing Company were exchanged for 262 shares of the Lancaster Cotton Mill stock. Before Leroy Springs' death, Eureka and Springsteen had been merged, February 17, 1931, keeping Eureka's name and original charter. The Springsteen buildings became cotton warehouses for Eureka. On November 25, 1931, 2,535 shares of stock in the Lancaster Cotton Mills were exchanged for 3,500 shares of Eureka stock. The deed of all Eureka property was acquired by the Lancaster Cotton Mills on December 28, 1931. A renovated Springsteen reemerged two years later as a separate operating plant. For a year and a half, Elliott Springs was president of the Lancaster Cotton Mills and its subsidiary plants in Fort Mill and Chester, and, in addition, was president of the Kershaw, Kershaw Cotton Mill. The Kershaw Cotton Mill had not shown a profit since 1928 and had no prospects of showing a profit in 1933. Stock shares in the Kershaw Cotton Mill were held by a diverse group of more than 40 local citizens and three Kershaw businesses. The single largest stockholder was the Kershaw Oil Mill, 30.6% of the total, whose largest stockholder was John T. Stevens, a Leroy Springs partner for many years. Elliot and his stepmother, Lena Jones Springs, owned only 6.42% of the Kershaw Cotton Mill stock. Although Kershaw had not shown a profit for four years, Elliot decided not to abandon it. He met with Kershaw stockholders and offered a plan which would allow the Kershaw owners to join the Lancaster Cotton Mills group proportionately. The exchange of Kershaw stock for stock of the Lancaster Cotton Mills was made on August 17, 1933, and the Kershaw Charter was surrendered a week later. 
The second stage of consolidation followed immediately. On the same day that Kershaw Cotton Mill was absorbed by the Lancaster Cotton Mills, Lancaster's charter was amended to change its name to the Springs Cotton Mills, which remained the name of the company throughout Elliott Springs' presidency. In December 1933, four months after the consolidation, Springs purchased the Chester plant of Aragon Baldwin Cotton Mills, a subsidiary of J.P. Stevens, for $300,000. The Baldwin plant, built in 1900 and known as the Wiley Mill until 1912, was renamed Gale Plant in honor of Walter Gale's role in acquiring the machinery. Elliott Springs and Walter Gale had inherited D.A. Tompkins' mantle as the leading machinery salesman and textile engineer of the South. Gale was the only plant Elliot named for someone who was not a family member. And this is a 1930s photograph of the Lancaster plant. It may have been arranged by Elliot Springs as part of his protest against the, drug, the governing board under the NIRA. Springs contended the board was dominated by Northerners who wished to drive Southern textile mills into bankruptcy. This is for sale for taxes. By consolidating his cotton mill properties into a single company and by centralizing management, Elliott Springs made it possible to utilize his resources more efficiently. Centralized purchasing and coordinated marketing became possible for the first time. The reorganization laid the foundation for advances yet to come. The modernization of the plants, the building of a giant bleachery, the establishment of a selling house, and the spring-made advertising campaign which would build a national brand name and strong consumer sales. In Elliott's first three years as president of a textile company, he displayed incredible energy, audacity, and shrewdness. He surprised the giant New York banks and commission houses who confidently expected Leroy Springs' playboy son to fall flat on his face. Elliot had some close calls, but he did not fall. By the end of 1933, he could relish the irony of the old colonel helping him out. It was his father who had baited the trap unwittingly by constantly telling the New Yorkers not to deal with Elliot because he knows nothing about cotton running a cotton mill, or selling cloth. Elliot's survival was all the more remarkable because it was accomplished in the face of the greatest industrial depression the nation had ever suffered. Before Roosevelt took office, Elliot Springs realized that he would have to modernize to keep his mills going. That would be his next step, and it would require all of his skill and courage. He had limited capital. The depression was forcing many of his competitors to close. Others were running on short time. Textile prices were at rock bottom, and even at those prices, sales were hard to come by. The way that Springs got new, or newer, machinery was a masterpiece of planning and a demonstration of faith that, had, that the depression wouldn't last forever. In June 1932, Elliott Springs ordered the transfer of machinery from the closed-down Springsteen plant to Eureka Plant No. 1 at Hemlock Station, which had been shut down for several months. Annexes were constructed at Eureka for the Springsteen machinery. This increased Eureka to 45,000 spindles and 1,100 looms. The stripped Springsteen buildings, which housed, which housed Chester's first cotton mill, remained cotton warehouses for the time being. The Eureka people went back to work three months later alongside the former Springsteen employees who had moved two miles to operate their old machines now in place in the Eureka plant. For more than two years, Elliot Springs and his agent, Walter Gale, along with Lee Skipper, were out bargain hunting for good used machinery. They found most of what they wanted in New England Cards that would have cost Springs $4,000 in 1950 were purchased for $30 in 1933. He bought spinning frames valued at $60 to $125 a spindle in 1944 to 46 for 10 cents a spindle in 1933. 
Springs and Gale bought a large quantity of looms worth about $1,000 each for $25 apiece, plus the railway freight to South Carolina. A bankrupt New England mill trying to avoid taxes gave Springs all of its machinery just for dismantling and hauling it away. In that manner, Springs was able to reopen Springsteen with the most up-to-date machinery that it had ever had. Equipment in all of the mills was upgraded. Six carloads of machinery from New Hartford, New York, arrived in Fort Mill on December 9, 1931. As soon as the plants had received enough spinning and weaving machinery, Springs was in the market for generators and boilers. He located what he needed in Bay City, Michigan, Cohoes, Co Co I don't know how you say that, Cohoes, New York, and Utica, New York. Again, he got what he wanted for little more than the cost of shipping. The largest single shipment came in the summer of 1933. And down here, this is a picture of the first highway patrol unit in Chester County. They posed in the 1930s in front of the Lloyd Building, an exhibit building, at the Chester County Fairgrounds. The first patrolman on the left is Frank Wilkes. Ansel Lagar is the fourth from the left. The others are unidentified. The building burned in the early 1980s. The first two cars at left have the same license plate numbers, an obvious but unintentional mixing of the front and rear plates when used. On June 27, 1933, Springs requested various railroads to route him 157 carloads of machinery that he had purchased from Bid Bidford, Maine, Hopedale, Massachusetts, Co Coes, <laughs> New York, Bay City, Michigan, Barberton, Ohio, Providence and Pawtucket in Rhode Island, and the New Hampshire towns of Newmarket and Somerset. The ancient Baldwin machinery in Gale Plant, which had been standing idle for several years, was replaced with bargain machinery from Massachusetts. January 19, 1934, Springs wrote in reference to Chester's Springsteen and Gale Plants, I have two new plants just starting up, and I expect great things of them, despite the fact that they are built entirely out of materials that someone else threw away last year. The combined capital of the Springs Cotton Mills equipped Eureka and provided its first electric power plant. In 1935, Eureka was enlarged with additional machinery from New England Cotton Mills. The quote-unquote new equipment gleaned from the New England mills allowed the Springs cotton mills to turn out a variety of fabrics. While the major production was in carded gray goods, Springs also produced mar marquisettes, onusbergs, towels, sheets, pillowcases, bedspreads, poplin, spun rayon fabrics, dress goods, countles, mom crepes, and piques. Peaks. Elliot Springs' decision to expand in the early 1930s was daring. Most businesses were co contracting or closing their doors. Recovery from the, numbering depres the numbing depression became the first priority of the New Deal. Measures were taken to make the banking system sounder, but some banks, even with government assistance, could not survive. The Bank of Fort Mill failed in August 1934. The Bank of Lancaster, founded by Leroy Springs, survived. Barefooted and overalled, Lee Skipper Jr. front and Sunny Springs inspect roving frames in the Lancaster plant sometime in the mid-1930s. Jobs for the unemployed, one-fourth of the nation's workforce, were needed. Young college graduates interested in textile careers were particularly depressed about the future of textiles. Clemson College had eight graduates in textile engineering in 1933. F. H. Martin, who was one of that number, later recalled that F. Gordon Cobb, the Lancaster superintendent, hired the whole senior class for $64 per week total. Martin, as did the others, performed a range of duties at the Lancaster plant. 
the young engineers were given duties in testing and evaluation, duties that involved routine checks for quality control, but also included some operations that were forerunners of the more sophisticated work that later came out of the testing laboratory. Martin was given a camera by Springs and instructed to keep photographic records. The pictures, along with performance reports, were sent to Sacco Lowell, White and Machinery, and other companies from whom Springs purchased machinery. Martin said that Springs insisted on quality at least partly because he wanted the quality to be a little better than the competition. He would at least have a margin there. He wanted, second, a lower cost than other people, and that's where he was interested in the machine and processing efficiency, which helped get a low cost. When Franklin D. Roosevelt was inaugurated President of the United States, he offered a comprehensive remedy for the Depression in the form of a large packet of legislation. The first hundred days of the New Deal saw a wide range of bills passed. The last bill of the package would have a tremendous impact on all industry, the National Industrial Recovery Act, NIRA. The legislation would present Elliott Springs with a combination of problems that would make survival during the Depression years even more difficult. Dealing with those problems would take much of his time and energy during the 1930s. The, the NIRA established the National Recovery Administration, NRA, to supervise a program of industrial self-regulation. The textile industry, under the watchful eye of the NRA, established minimum wages, maximum hours, and accepted the right of workers to unionize. The act was different from any previous labor law. For the first time, the federal government had a specific role in collective bargaining. In the new game, the government became both the rule maker and the umpire. Since the government had adopted labor unions as a junior partner, it became clear to industrialists that the old relationships of labor and management would not be sanctioned. Springs was convinced that the textile code of the NRA was designed to protect northern textile mills from southern textile competition. The code set the minimum wage at $12 a week in southern mills and $13 a week minimum in the north. Apprentice wages were accepted. For most of the Springs workers, the minimum yearly wage under the NIRA, assuming full employment, was about $600 a year. Compared to industrial wages nation nationwide, $600 a year was low, but compared to the income of South Carolina's farmers, even those farmers who owned their own farms, the mill wages were very attractive. For example, in 1934, Mary Fraser of Winthrop College conducted a study on expenditures for family living for 46 South Carolina rural families, all of them white non-tenant families, and discovered that their annual personal income was $174.24. Other studies made by Clemson College in the Works Progress Administration in the mid-1930s bear out the contention of Elliott Springs that his employees were better paid and better housed than the average South Carolinian. The NIRA was declared unconstitutional in 1935, but was immediately replaced by the Wagner Act. The act created a new National Labor Relations Board, NLRB, which upheld collective bargaining and was authorized to take testimony about unfair employer practices and issue cease and desist orders. Prodded by the government, cotton mills in general agreed to curtail production by 25%. Springs cooperated by reducing the work week from 55 hours to 40 hours. This raised the cost of production. Most of the South Carolina cotton manufacturers also cooperated with additional provisions for industry-wide curtailment, but Springs, James Self of Greenwood, and Colonel A. Foster McKissick at Pelzer were non-cooperators. Later, Self and McKissick decided to cooperate. Elliott cooperated in a limited fashion with traditional summer shutdowns, but Springs plants were never curta curtailed on the same schedule as the other mills. The American Cotton Textile Institute advocated statistical reporting by its member mills. 
the Cotton Textile Institute, CTI, also hoped to become a policy-shaping association. Elliot Springs, always cagey, suspected that if he cooperated with the institutes by giving them production and sales figures, he would lose whatever thin advantage he had. He refused to divulge any information not required by law. In one instance, when asked by the Cotton Textile Code Authority for an accounting of the number of looms and spindles that he had in operation, Elliot wrote that his bookkeeper had suffered a nervous breakdown and that he had taken up the task himself but had encountered problems in compiling the exact information the code authority wished. Evading answers to the questions on the form, Springs suggested that part of the reason for his difficulty in accounting was that he had some frames on railroad cars, some frames in temporary storage, and a few unidentifiable frames in Lancaster that he thought floated down the river from Mount Holly in the flood of 1916. After a lengthy, tongue-in-cheek explanation as to why he was late with the report, Springs ended with no mention of any specific number of looms or spindles. Privately, Elliot Springs wrote other diehards that his grandfather White was right to stay south of the Mason-Dixon line. Samuel Elliot White has told his grandson that the way to get ahead was to work hard, look after his own people, and keep everything local. It was good advice. In 1931, only 13% of the spindles and 10% of the looms in South Carolina were owned by Northern Interests. In 1949, Northern Interests owned 60% of the spindles and 59% of the looms. By that time, figures would show that the Springs Cotton Mills was by far South Carolina's largest native-owned cotton mill property. Changing the corporate structure of his mills was modernized, and modernizing the obsolete plants he had inherited was a challenge, but the something that transformed Elliott Springs from a reluctant mill president to a committed one appears to have been the labor crisis that swept like wildfire across the industrial Piedmont in the summer and fall of 1934. While the most intense part of the textile unionization drive in the South would last less than a year, Elliot saw the all-out effort as a critical challenge to his leadership. He wanted no, th no third party standing between him and Spring's people. He would emerge from the crisis with a firm resolve to keep faith with the loyalty he received from his people. Labor organizers, most of them associated with the United Textile Workers of America, but a few more radical, had gotten a toehold in some North Carolina mills. Using those mills as bases, they attempted to recruit new members from other mills. The union organizing effort often led to violence. Bloodshed occurred in the Lorray Mills in nearby Gastonia, North Carolina. Rock Hill, South Carolina, less than 10 miles from Fort Mill, was a hotbed of unrest. Militant Union locals had established in Great Falls its J.P. Stevens plant and in Union's Giant Monarch plant, both within an hour's drive of Springs Chester plants. And up here, before we go, we're going to read about the dope wagon. I have no idea what this is. I've never read this. But together we're going to read about the dope wagon in this little section. The dope wagon. Back in the early 1920s, young fellows wearing aprons with big pockets, either carrying trays or pushing carts, were a welcome sight to tired and hungry workers at Lancaster cotton mills. Theo Elliott, George Thomas, Jeff Lowry and Fred Ezell were among the first dope boys. The quote-unquote dope they peddled consisted of soft drinks and snacks. In 1987, Robert Ellison of Lancaster recalled how he helped his older brother Theo make peanut butter sandwiches at night for the next day's sale. The simple operation expanded into a major one a few years later when Edward, Mr. Ed Mahaffey, took over the short order lunchroom and added hamburgers, hot dogs, candies, and peanuts, along with orange crush, grape soda, Coca-Cola, and milk. 
When Robert Elliott started work, he was an ice cream boy selling popsicles, ice cream, and frozen cake from a refrigerated cart. His sales were so good that the dope boys complained that he was getting ahead of them and spoiling their customers' appetites with ice cream. To remove Robert's competition, the dope boys persuaded the Mahaffeys to show them to allow them to divide up their routes and give Robert a share. Robert found himself to be the first and last ice cream boy. As a dope boy, Robert would come in at one o'clock and find his cart filled with ice and packed by the bottle boy with enough ale, 22 crates, to make a round of the cloth room. The route took an hour and a half to cover. The heavy dope wagon was about six feet long and two and a half feet wide four feet high and had a tray with two by twos fitted down on the inside of the tray to sit on inside for the tray to sit on cook would cook up say 100 hamburgers 100 hot dogs and would have it fixed up knew the order the tray would carry 50 or 60 dollars worth the dope boy didn't have to worry about constantly making change the people charged and paid at the end of the week We had a regular little time book, and my wife done my list. I had to learn those names. My first stop would be in Warp. I'd push my wagon to you, and you'd help yourself. I had my account book, and everybody who got anything would hold it up to me, and I knew you by name. All in alphabetical order. Dope was six cents and was written in the book like an upside-down exclamation mark. One mark and a dot. If you got 25 cents worth, it was five marks. When most of their customers were earning from eight to $12 a week, the dope boys were often earning 10 to 15 times as much. On my route, maybe I would take in $30 a week cash and the rest of it on credit. My route would run run $1,000 a week, maybe a little more, and my percentage would be $130. Mr. Ed always paid his dope boys 13% When Robert Elliott got a prime route in the spinning room that serviced about 300 people, he made $10,000 a year. I was making more money than the boss man. Dope wagons operated in all Springs plants until 1948 when the cafeteria system was initiated. Robert Elliott, with time out for service in World War II, worked as a dope boy until the cafeteria opened. Maisie Mahaffey went into managing the cafeteria and I went to fix and shoes. And this was Robert Elliott, who was interviewed by Rebecca Park in Lancaster, February 1987. That is just a little bit of the history from the 20s and 30s of Springs Mills. Thank you so much for watching. Hope you have a great day, and I will see you again soon.